Hello there. How you doing? Good, good, really good. So actually, the previous speaker has has disconnected abruptly. Uh, so I think they put you on stage uh, there, but it's totally fine. So he may he may uh, he may come up like in 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 one minute. So in case <laughs> in case uh, uh, it ha he appears, right? Uh, don't be surprised uh, uh, there. Uh, but yeah, we can I still can ask you how are you today. Very good, very good, very excited. Um, coming to you live from my uh, research facility deep in the heart of Kentucky, which is my basement. And I'm very excited. I wish I was there in Paris with you. Uh, you know I love Paris. It's my favorite event every year. But this is as close as we can get, and I'm happy to be here. Yeah, yeah. The only thing, uh, the only thing I can do, because thanks to you, we've learned to use, uh, uh, let's say, uh, um, OBS, right? You know the the tool, <laughs> you know. So I can. This is the best I can. I can give this is, to you, right? This is excellent. This is excellent. I was looking at pictures of of this of the city just this morning to kind of get myself excited again. So I appreciate the appreciate the background. Yeah, yeah. So this is the only what I can do so far uh, for the sense of Paris. But glad to uh, to have you there physically uh, in a in another time. So it seems uh, uh, Najid cannot join us again. <laughs> Uh, yeah, uh, for uh, so I hope, uh, uh, yeah, he doesn't, it's okay, okay. Or, or at least for him or his, his network. Uh, yep. but now it's the time for you, Mike. And we, you've been keynote many times of APRS Paris to open the conference, and now we thought it was great to have you as a, one of the uh, ending this uh, uh -huh. this track, right, with a talk called Reconning, Reconnecting with Our Future's Past, right? So, yes, yes. yeah, yeah. I invite you to share your slides. Okay. I'm going to be actually sharing them here so everyone can maximize my screen. We won't have an extra screen share throughout this uh, presentation, and we'll be all set. That's good. Thank you, Mike. Enjoy. Okay. Thank you very much, Mehdi. We'll talk to you soon. All right. Hello, everyone. It's fantastic to be here. As I said before, uh, I always love my trips to Paris. Uh, this is me, Mike Amundsen. This is me, how you find me on LinkedIn and GitHub and Twitter and YouTube. I would love to connect with you, learn what you're working on and what kind of projects you're, uh, you're working on today that are challenging in the API and microservice and connection space. Um, this is my uh, moment to mention that I uh, recently released a book on uh, API development. It's a kind of a catch-all book on all the processes. There's like 13 chapters that walk you through the actual API story all the way to modifying an existing API. If you like some of the things you hear here, there's more in this book as well. But what I'd like to do is something a little bit different. I'd like to take us on a little bit of time travel. Uh, and uh, this has been a really challenging year for all the world, and I thought maybe we should get some perspective, look back a little bit in the last hundred years, and give us an opportunity to look forward in the next hundred years. And to do that, I'll be visiting with a whole bunch of acquaintances. You see some of them here, and we'll talk with them as we go through our time travel today. Now, uh, time travel uh, means that we can do whatever we want. So I'm going to go back to the 1900s, the last turn of the century that we had. In the 1900s, it was the heyday of bicycles. Bicycles were thought to be this great socializing thing that everyone could use anywhere. You might think of them the way we think of scooters today. Radio, uh, by the turn of the century, was beginning pervasive in lots and lots of places. We were sending messages. We were sending content uh, uh, to each other. And cinema, Lumiere, and uh, all these other uh, people had started to uh, create film, movies, moving pictures. And of course, one of the uh, signal events of this era was electricity, lighting. The Chicago Exposition in the late 1800s taught us what it would be like if we could have sunshine all day. It was an amazing time. There were lots and lots of things going on. And, and it was at this time that H.G. Wells, a, a British author, wrote the book Time Machine about this notion of traveling in time. And he gave us this idea that we could travel forward or back in time, that we were really always just on the edge of a new beginning. Um, he actually was very concerned about social uh, destruction, um, uh, disruption, and he wanted to write this book to give people a chance to start thinking about the responsibility we have for time in the future. 
And he really made this, gave us this notion that there were these ideas of timelines, of alternate times. Each of us live on a, on a timeline, and every decision that we make, the, the simplistic theory goes, starts a new timeline into the future. We get a very similar message from Mel Conway. The very act of organizing a team means that we've made decisions, and those decisions knock out other possibilities. We can no longer do things because we have made decisions already. So I want to sort of play on this idea of making decisions. What are the decisions that were made 100 years ago that brought us to where we are today? And what are the decisions that we are making now that will affect 100 years from now? Every day, every morning we get up, we're at a crossroads. We are at a crossroads today. And what are we doing? What are we doing to think about what will be the effects 100 years from now? So what I'm going to do is kind of visit various little alternate timelines in all these worlds, decisions that were made, and explore those a little bit. And one of the timelines I want to explore is the idea of networks. Uh, and the first person I want to talk uh, to, to talk about is Paul Otle. Uh, Paul Otle, at the turn of the century, within almost 100 years ago today, was thinking of the notion of networking all these movies and sounds and text and all these things together into a single, what he called a worldwide network so that anyone would be able to read enlarged or limited. He meant, he meant you know, detailed or expanded uh, on the subject and project on your own individual screen. Here it was a hundred years ago. He had this vision of what we would be doing in the future. He mapped out this idea of what he called the mundanium, this place where all the facts would be stored. And he even uh, uh, created all of these ways that we could, we could listen in on radio broadcasts for the opera or we could view movies and so on, things like that. This is a mock-up of one of his workstations, what he thought would be possible. You can see a radio and lots of research cards and charts and graphs. He had a very detailed uh, cataloging system. As typical for this part of the century, he thought in visionary terms. He imagined an, uh, an extraterritorial city-state, a world city where everyone would come, a kind of Alexander of the future, Library of Alexander, where everything, everyone would come together, experts on subjects and experts on information categorization, and they would create the content that would appear on this network. Some people have said this is sort of like the Google of the turn of the century. I think it's more like the Wikipedia of the turn of the century. And you can see how grand a scale that he was thinking at this time. This is where his people would work. He would collect up information experts and they would turn all sorts of detailed papers into single cards. You could actually send a postal note and you could ask them on a subject. They would go through all the cards and they would collect up their own monographs, custom build a paper for you on the subject, just as you might think a Google search or a Wikipedia entry might be created. Now, what's really amazing is within 20 years, within 15 to 20 years of, of uh, Otley's ideas, um, Vannevar Bush comes up with what he calls the Memex, a device that's actually based on film strips that you would subscribe to. And this looks like amazingly like uh, Otley's workstation. But in his uh, mind, um, Vannevar Bush had this idea that we would have this workstation where we could view all this content and jump around in a non-linear way. In other words, we make our own story. We make our own timeline throughout the process. And, it, and, and this inspired another gentleman by the name of Engelbart. Engelbart in the 50s read uh, uh, Vannevar Bush's ideas, and it inspired him by the 1960s to actually create the very machine that actually worked. It's because of Engelbart that we have the mouse, and that we have links on pages, and that we have uh, connections and collaborative uh, editing and picture in picture and all these other things. Now, at the same time that Engelbart is doing his work, there's another gentleman in California, and his name is Ted Nelson. Ted is credited with giving us the words hypertext and hyperlink and hyperdata. And he's thinking this idea of connections. Everything is a connection. Now, the way Ted thought about it is you'd have links applied to existing text. You would never change the text. The links would go over the existing text. And he had uh, what he called a docuverse, very similar to this notion of Otley, but not a universe, but a docuverse. And it, it's so, it was so uh, ahead of its time that it wasn't until about 10 years ago that somebody actually built a working docuverse 
based on Ted's ideas. Uh, and it's called Xanadu. It's been around for, for decades and decades. Uh, Ted uh, put a lot of his ideas into a book called uh, Computer Lib and Machine Dreams. It's actually two books that, are, that were hand-drawn and typed out that he laid out himself. Uh, you can actually get reprint copies of this book. I'm very lucky to have a signed copy of Ted's book. Um, and it's an amazing way to think about it. These were published in 1970s. Now, it turns out that there is somebody who actually built the, the, the document system the Xanadu type document system that Ted talked about using the tools that Engelbart had built. And that is Dame Wendy Hall. Dame Wendy Hall was focused totally on the idea of connecting information. She was a mathematician that was given the task of actually uh, cataloging uh, Britain's Mountbatten uh, historical archives. And to do that, she was faced with tons and tons of material. She designed it based on Ted's ideas of linking systems and Engelbart's tooling into a thing called microcosm, a working hypertext system. Microcosm was up and running and working in Britain in the mid 80s before Sir Tim Berners-Lee had even showed off his first version of his browser in HTTP and HTML. And it followed all the ideas that Ted had been talking about. So here in this timeline, we can just see over the course of less than a hundred years, the notion of Otley thinking into the future, of Vannevar Bush, of a Douglas Engelbart, of Ted Nelson, and Wendy Hall actually bringing this to reality in the microcosm system. So now I want to I want to stop and I want to take another timeline. I want to talk about machines. I'm going to back up a little bit to the beginning of creating programming for machines. And in the very beginning, I want to talk about the ENIAC six. ENIAC was the first. Um, a computing machine. It was conceived by uh, Mockley and Eckert and uh, John von Neumann, but it was actually programmed by what were called computers, people who computed tables. Betty Snyder, Gene Jennings, Kay McNulty, Marilyn Westkoff, Ruth Lichterman, and Francis Vilas were the six people that actually figured out how to actually tame the original computers. The way you programmed computers in the 40s and early 50s was literally hard wiring. That's where we get the term of hard wiring. They had to figure out from schematics how to get all these tubes and wires to actually compute information. Now, here's a shot. You can see in the, in the foreground, you can actually see von Neumann mugging for the camera like he's turning a knob. Von Neumann has no idea how to, comp how to program this machine. But that's Kay McNulty in the background uh, that you can see working the machine as well. And I, I, think, uh, I think that may be Lichterman in the front. I can't really tell from this photo. These were the people who knew how to actually make the computer work. They established the notions of sorting algorithms and routines and all the programming methodology that we have today came from the ENIAC 6. This was their practice machine downstairs in the basement uh, in uh, Pennsylvania in Philadelphia where they built uh, uh, the original uh, UNIVAC and uh, ENIAC uh, machine. Now, one of the people who learned from the ENIAC and then moved with several of the ENIAC 6 to a company called UNIVAC that Eckert and Motley created was Grace Hopper, Admiral Grace Hopper from the Navy. I love her line, programming is a gigantic undertaking in the foundations of knowledge. Most of what we know about computer programming today, the notion of application-specific languages, all comes from Grace Hopper. We have COBOL and Fortran and all those other things. She's called the grandma of COBOL, for example, because of Hopper. Hopper, this is Hopper at a workstation on your left at one of the earliest compilers where you would type in information and we compile into punch tape that would then be fed into a computer that no longer just needed wires. It could actually be programmed in memory. And this is another shot of her showing others, this is what a computer workstation looked like in the 50s and early 60s. There were no screens involved. It turns out Grace Hopper left a fantastic legacy of education and advocacy. For the last 25 years, quarter century, there's been a thing called the Grace Hopper Celebration Conferences. 29 countries from around the world in, in, in 2020. And this is really her legacy of bringing computing uh, to the modern world. Now, uh, after uh, this idea of Hopper, we also have Adele Goldberg and Alan Kay, the people at Xerox Park who are credited with creating things like the small talk language, the notion of object-oriented programming and message passing to an interface, and the actual idea of Dynabook itself. 
the Park Group, uh, uh, Goldberg and Kay in particular, were constantly trying to figure out how to turn computers into something that were small and lightweight. This is, this is what's called a luggable on the left. You might remember K-Pros and others. Here's an example of the early Smalltalk interface they wrote um, for uh, uh, Research Park. And then here's a, a, a prototype and mock-up of the Dynabook, what we know as readers or as laptops today. And by the way, this is when they were working on the Altos, or that's the Altos over on the right. Um, that's the basically a, a refrigerator-sized machine that they thought one day would sit on your lap. People thought they were nuts at the time. So there you can see this idea of the, of the passage of machinery from the 1940s into the 1980s and 90s. Uh, through the ENIAC 6, Grace Hopper, Adele Goldberg, and, and Alan Kay. So we get these ideas about these timelines, about what they could be like and what, what could have happened. How close did we come? How well did we do? What Now that we're into the future, those visions that they had for what the information systems would be, what are they like today? Well, let's think about the network, the what I call the Otley Nelson Hall Networks a planetary library in an extraterritorial city state. We don't have that yet. We have the UN, we have the IETF, we have some versions of it, but we never really reached this notion of this, this sort of library of Alexandria. Links as an added layer on an unspoiled con, uh, text. We never really get, made that happen. It died out with, with Wendy Hall's microcosm system. Even though she had created a fully working one, we are now mixing links and all these other things inside text. And it's difficult to, to manage provenance and, and uh, link backs and all these other things. Ted's been quoted as saying, the, the web we have today is the very thing he was trying to prevent from happening. And of course, resource-based op uh, open message passing systems, Wendy Hall showed us exactly how to do that. And most of the things that we do today on the web really were rooted in Hall's ideas about how to uh, link and connect information. What about the machine side? What about the programming side? I, I pick, I pick uh, Kay McNulty because Kay was actually very active at both the, uh, in ENIAC and UNIVAC Futures, but Kay Hopper Goldberg. Organized coherent machine language routines, that's what we got from the earliest ENIAC and UNIVAC, and we have those today. Most of us program in these sort of machine language routines of some kind. But Hopper had this vision of a domain-specific set of application languages that were basically self-documenting, that you would literally speak to or, or connect with or communicate with a computer very much in a human-centric -centric way. We still don't do that today. We all, all of us, we have maybe some task-oriented, like query-oriented languages or document-oriented languages, but we don't have application-specific or domain languages yet. We don't have medical languages or, or, or health languages or finance languages. We, we actually have to craft every single one of those on our own. Goldberg and Kay saw a world where we had opaque uh, components that passed messages back and forth. That's the API legacy. We're getting most of that today, but it turns out a lot of that is still very, very brittle. We're only on the very early edge of what they were trying to do. So we've visited lots and lots of people and seen lots and lots of uh, timelines. I want to stop now and talk a little bit about one more thing. And that is this idea of horizons or visions. It turns out not everything is rosy. There are lots of alternative realities. We make decisions every day. We didn't quite get to where Otley and Hopper and Hall and Goldberg wanted us to be. Where do we want to be now, and how likely is it that we're going to get there? One of the challenges I see over the last 50 years is a reduction in our vision, a reduction in our horizons that's affected all aspects of life. At the height of the space age, at the height of, 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 of uh, re-engineering and rethinking society, um, we have Milton Friedman in 1970 who makes this speech and writes this paper that says, Business only, the only responsibility of business is to make a profit, to back off the notion of business as a vital part of society. In fact, Milton Friedman is famous for saying he's in favor of cutting taxes anywhere, anytime, whenever possible. Friedman has this, this notion that business and profiteering will actually make us free. Within 10 years of Milton's talk, we have... Uh, 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 
environmental crisis, an oil crisis, an oil crash. And then President Carter gives a speech about the crisis of confidence, a speech that later becomes the Malaise speech of 1979. Carter sees that business is not going to solve everything, that we have wider social responsibilities in the world. And he says, we're, we're really seeing this doubt about the meaning of our lives. And he wants people to think about what they're doing today and what it means for our future. By giving this speech, Carter uh, makes sure that he can't get reelected president. He's a downer. He's a bummer. He's telling people they can't have everything they want. In fact, an actor decides, you know what? I can beat this guy in an election real easy. And he does. And in his opening uh, inaugural speech, Ronald Reagan claims that government is not the solution. Government is the problem. He wants even smaller government. Within another generation, we have another president that says American doesn't need big government doesn't want big government. Government gets smaller and smaller and smaller until finally today, we have somebody in the United States who's really only focused on transactional analysis, who back in the 90s was once characterized as a person who learned to turn politics into money. And in each step along that way, our horizon gets shorter and shorter and shorter until maybe we don't have much left. Now, like any good story, there are other parallels, there are other alternate versions of this story. There are other timelines where things work out better, where things actually are uh, improved. And I'm gonna take just one version of that timeline. The same year, within, within months of when Friedman gave that responsibility speech, we had our very first Earth Day observation across the United States. Earth Day was started by John McConnell, the son of a Pentecostal minister. John. McConnell was uh, obsessed with peace and bringing peace to the world. He, um, he had a JFK peace memorial. He started uh, the, inter the Society uh, uh, for um, the, the Earth Day Foundation. At the same time, Douglas Engelbart, remember I talked about Doug Engelbart before? Doug Engelbart did not stop thinking about the future. He said the digital revolution would be more significant than writing or even printing. And he continued to work toward this notion of connections around the world. And of course, Tim Berners-Lee has been doing the same thing. He says, we haven't even seen the web that he's envisioned. He's, I love this line, the future is still so much bigger than the past. So here we are again, we're at this crosswords, we're at this timeline, what are we going to do? I'm reminded of this fantastic story from Jobs where Jobs basically says the computer is the equivalent of the bicycle for our minds. It, it powers us in new ways. It gives us a chance to rethink everything. And it reminds me again, all the way back to H.G. Wells. Wells loved bicycles. Remember, Wells thought bicycles were a real social uh, leveler that gave people a chance to do all sorts of things. When he says, when I see an adult on a bicycle, I no longer despair for the future of the human race. This is us every day. We get up, we go to the door, we are on the edge of our futures. We get to choose every single day, just like Conway told us. What are we going to choose? What are the alternate uh, realities that we are going to create? What are we gonna do today that affects people 100 years from now? That's our mission, that's our task. I can't tell you what the future is gonna be like, but I can borrow a line from Alan Kay. The best way to predict the future is to create it. And what I want to tell you today is go out there, create that future, take that step every day. You can make it just a little bit better. And we can reconnect with all those futures that we've missed out on. And we can build a new future, a new set of futures for everyone. And I hope this has been in, in some way inspiring. I'll share these slides and all the research material behind it. And I just want to say thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mike. Wow, that's a that's a long. Uh, we, we should have uh, two hours of questions there, uh, <laughs> right? That's, uh, a, that's yeah. a lot. Of, that's a lot of time travel in twenty minutes, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So uh, yeah, at least with a replay, we can time travel to when you say yeah. it. Two two questions rise uh, uh, directly from there. Uh, Etienne Klein, which is a, 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 a PhD in nuclear science and philosopher and head of research in France. Uh, used to say that uh, in the 60s, in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 
we had the two, the year 2000 as the peak of the future, right? Yeah. And, and he said that we climbed we we climbed that that peak, right? But now we are moving from that peak, so we are falling down from the future. The future is far from us right it goes further and further and further in in the bad way not in the good way right yeah, because we yeah. don't have we, we don't invent the future anymore do you do you agree with that yes i think that that's really one of the keys that i, I tried to end with this idea that we i don't think we're doing a good job of of stretching that horizon outward we have so many possible things i was promised a jetpack right this is i, I i'm resentful i was promised all this leisure activity all these things that i could do but yes, we're all still working so hard. And of course, this is a terrible year right now. Um, but we're, we have so much opportunity. And whether it's you know, Elon Musk and SpaceX or, or, or uh, all these other things, there are lots and lots of opportunities of our future. But our future needs to be distributed. You know, William Gibson had this idea, the future is here, but it's not distributed evenly. Uh, we need to distribute our future across the entire planet, all countries, all worlds, all cities, all societies, and that's definitely not happening. We need more of that horizon, like uh, Etienne was talking about. Yeah, uh, last question here. But uh, so Peter Thiel also say what happened to the future, right? We wanted flying cars. We just have 140 characters networks, right? Uh, so yeah. that's the idea. But uh, a recent paper from Google actually showed that we we uh, now we can we have Google scholars and now we have search engines actually. We, we begin to, researchers begin to look more for all the papers, right? That was not accessible before. So we were always reinventing the wheel and research because from what you say, what do we invent today? All, all have been already thought, right? We just, we just need to, we just need uh, to, to make it, right? We just need to invent it. That, that's only part of the story. There are lots of things that people propose today that sound ridiculous. What Otley proposed sounded ridiculous. What Engelbart proposed sounded ridiculous. What, what Hopper described as programming sounded ridiculous. We need to focus on those ridiculous things. That's our 100 years future. Not just realizing what was thought of 50 years ago or 100 years ago, but the things today that sound crazy, that's our future. And we should be finding ways to make that happen as well, I think. So, yeah, we will never listen, let's say, crazy people who looks like crazy uh, uh thinkers uh in the same way because you know they may, they are just right but not uh too too soon right you know All right yes that's what i think yeah that's that's a famous quote like it's not great to be right too soon too early <laughs> and alone that's right? good that's and very good that's really so, good. so yeah so that's good thank you very much mike for for this Excellent. definitely we'll re invite you for a longer one because uh we okay. are in the chat some people uh, congratulating for the journey and uh, uh, the wonderful inside journey, right? Uh, that you excellent, you, and I'd be happy to talk with anyone online. We'll, we'll, I'll be around all day tomorrow, and we'll talk some more. Yeah, thank you very much, Mike. Uh, you can uh, uh, disconnect.